Thank you all for joining us today, both our in-theatre audience and those joining us online. My name is Andrew Detmer, I'm the National President of the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union and a Safe Work Australia member. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and to this region, and I pay my respects to their elders both past and present. Today's discussion explores the crucial action area from the Australian strategy, healthy and safe by design, and how it applies to the safe design of machinery. Healthy and safe by design means that hazards and risks are eliminated or minimised at the design phase, that is, before they enter the workplace. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to share with you a real story. A casual factory hand was helping out at a plant that makes cardboard boxes. On this particular day, he had moved into a tight space between a printer, the slotter and stacker machine, and the outtake conveyor. It is understood that he was trying to remove some jammed cardboard pieces. His clothing became caught on a roller, spinning at over 60 revolutions per minute, and he was dragged over the top. Another worker heard him scream, located and pushed the emergency stop button, and ran to help him. He remained trapped in the machine for over 45 minutes. Ambulance officers tried to keep him alive while the fire brigade worked to free him. He was eventually freed and rushed to hospital, but he died the following day. His death was completely preventable. The subsequent WorkSafe and coroner's report found no hazard identification had been undertaken before the plant was commissioned. The emergency stops were not properly labelled. The company had not provided adequate information nor training regarding the machine's safe use and the level of its supervision was inadequate. Across Australia, all works health and safety laws require designers and manufacturers to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, that machinery is designed and manufactured to be without risks to health and safety and to provide adequate and up-to-date information about the machinery. Yet the story I've just told you and data from Safe Work Australia tells us that the poor design of machinery continues to kill and injure workers. A recent Safe Work Australia report reveals 188 work-related deaths were possibly caused by the unsafe design of machinery between 2006 and 2011. Our research also tells us that involving experienced workers in the design and testing process before machinery enters the workplace results in better work health and safety outcomes for workers. We should and we must do better. So I am delighted that today our speakers will discuss this important topic. Our first panel member is the Executive Director of the Work Health and Safety Division with Safe Work New South Wales. Peter Dunphy has over 25 years experience in public health and work health and safety and is currently completing a doctorate of public health with the University of New South Wales. Welcome Peter. Our second panel member, Wes Wilkinson, is the Principal of Work Systems Technology. He is a qualified mechanical engineer, risk manager and human factors specialist. He is a certified practicing professional and has 30 years experience in industries such as agriculture, manufacturing and the legal and commerce sectors. Wes provides specialist consultancy services for the design and manufacture of machinery and is regularly called as an expert witness in major work health and safety prosecutions. Welcome Wes. Our third panel member, Dr Liz Bluff, is a research fellow with the National Research Centre for Health and Safety, Re Occupational Health and Safety Regulation with the Australian National University. Liz has over 30 years experience in research, policy, legislation and management of work health and safety. She authored Safe Design and Construction Machinery and Regulation, Practice and Performance, and co-authored Work Health and Safety Law and Policy. Welcome, Liz. Last but not least, let me introduce my old friend, today's facilitator, Brian Russell. He's the former Executive Director of Safe Work South Australia, and of course a member of Safe Work Australia, and played a key role in the introduction of national work health and safety legislation and national uniform mine safety laws and explosive legislation. Welcome, Brian, and please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, and I'll now hand over to Brian to start today's discussion. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us in the audience today and for those joining online. For those who are joining online, I invite you to tweet any comments or questions that you may have in the course of discussion 
You can do that through our um, live chat facility or through uh, the hashtag virtual WHS. Uh, just on that, I'll add that um, at the end of today's broadcast, we will be uh, providing an additional period of time where the speakers stay behind uh, to answer any additional questions online that uh, we didn't resolve through the course of discussion today. I would like take to take just a moment to reflect on some of the introductory uh, comments that uh, Andrew made. And um, regrettably, the tragic story that Andrew told us about today uh, is all too common. The fact that we have almost uh, 200 deaths over a five year period related to unsafe uh, machinery and poorly designed machinery is alarming. Uh, for that reason, the elimination, minimisation of hazards at the design stage is a, uh, a priority in the uh, Australian work health and safety strategy. Um, in that sense, Safe Work Australia members are united in efforts to elevate safety and design as a national action area. And uh, that underscores the discussion that we're having here today. And uh, people often bandy about expressions about safe design and safe machinery, um, but they're not really sure at times what that means. What I would like to do today is to explore that a little bit further, and I'll start off with you, Peter, as a regulator. What's your understanding of safe design and safe machinery? Yeah, well, Brian, uh, I think as regulators, we can often have uh, lofty ideals, but I think it can be explained really quite simply that for us, really, safe design is about thinking ahead. It's really about uh, thinking through the whole life cycle of the, um, the plant that you're, you're dealing with, thinking about the sorts of things that can injure you along the way of use of that plant, uh, and really then going through a harm prevention process of really uh, ensuring that you identify what the, the hazards are that arise <laughs> out of all the life cycle of the, um, the plant. Uh, and then ensuring that you either eliminate those or, or control those, um, and that you also ensure that you risk communicate so that you provide appropriate information around uh, the actual item of plant, whether that be safe operating procedures or whether that can be um, in terms of training. And I guess from a regulatory perspective, that's how we see it. I don't know, Liz, from an academic perspective, whether the, the literature characterises it any differently to that, but, um, but certainly that's how we, we certainly um, see mm. it, yes. Liz, do you? Mm. Um, uh, certainly, yes. I think that um, uh, Peter's highlighted some important <coughs> principles with that. And I think um, one of the main things that uh, works well in terms of uh, improving safety at the design stage is for those who are involved in designing and manufacturing to be very conscious of the different ways in which machinery can be hazardous. And that might seem like a fairly obvious point, but for a lot of people, um, safety of machinery starts and finishes with mechanical hazards and the issue of guarding. Um, but there are a lot of other ways in which machinery can be hazardous. So it can be hazardous in terms of different aspects of the structure or the power sources that are used that raise safety <coughs> issues. Uh, there may be ergonomic issues related to the um, working positions and postures of people or perhaps the design of controls which might be poor so that they're hard to interpret. There can be problems of noise, vibration, substances that are used in or produced by machinery. Um, and there can also be issues related to access and it's something that's really quite commonly overlooked is whether people can get easy access without slip trip fall problems um, onto or into where they have to be working um, with machinery. So I guess the, the pitfall there is when people have a, a bit of a narrow focus on certain types of issues and don't properly, uh, properly recognise the range of problems that there can be with machinery. Mm. And I think um, it commissioning and decommissioning a plant is a really important aspect too, which often gets overlooked in terms of that, in terms of safe design. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, yeah. Liz, for that as well. <laughs> um, Peter, in, in terms of the laws, uh, how, is, uh, how is safe design covered in the work health and safety laws, and what are the legal duties that mm. apply to people who are responsible? Yeah, well, safe design is really picked up. It is really a cornerstone of our work health and safety legislation. So uh, in terms of the primary duty holders, a person conducting a business or undertaking, it is a, a critical component of their um, 
ensuring work health and safety and ensuring the safety of their workers. So the maintenance and, um, and ongoing provision of safe plans at a workplace is a really important aspect. It also follows on to the, the further duties which are in the, uh, the work health and safety legislation and that, that sort of tracks through the life cycle of whether it's the designer who has duties, whether it's the, uh, the manufacturer, the importer, the supplier, someone who's in control of plant or whoever's um, installing or decommissioning the plant. So it's a really broad range of duties that are covered um, across there and it's a very comprehensive duty um, I I and a, a very important feature of our work health and safety legislation. So the laws cover all aspects with respect to safety and design from the actual design process through to commissioning and the operation of the equipment itself? Yeah, so it's, it really is about trying to make sure that um, we do have um, consideration to safety at all aspects of the of the life cycle of the item of plant and it really is about ensuring that um, those are considered very much at the design phase but also during the life of the plant um, uh, in terms of that and ensuring that uh, that all duty holders and I, I shouldn't uh, forget other duty holders such as directors and um, and workers and others also have um, duties under the legislation to ensure that um, that they follow instructions that um, there's due diligence in terms of directors in in terms of the plant at a workplace so it's a very broad ranging um, duties and again I guess the other point is that those duties are often shared too amongst different people whether it's the PCBU the supplier the manufacturer and the designer so often they can be um, they can be overlapped in terms of um, those duties so it is really important in terms of the legislative framework that there is good coordination and cooperation amongst duty holders. Okay Liz I might just come back to you in terms of what works well for designers and manufacturers in this space and you mentioned the the range of issues that they need to consider. Would you like to expand on that a little? Um, well, I guess the next step in that is recognising that there is that sort of range of different ways in which machinery can be hazardous. Is um, for those who are designing and manufacturing machinery to also be well informed about the different options that are available in terms of the control or risk control in order to address those different types of hazards. So. Um, I guess what we're trying to do is encourage people to actually eliminate hazards um, and or uh, integrate state-of-the-art risk control measures. So really being familiar with what the different options might be um, is important to underpin that, um, that aspect of uh, designing things to be safer in the first instance. So uh, I, I suppose another important point to sort of underline in all of this is that what we're trying to encourage is making machinery inherently safer. And so that can be a bit of a pitfall um, if people tend to see machinery safety as being about um, providing warning signs or devices, um, you know, whether it's flashing lights on machinery or beeps or something like that. That can be an important part as supplementary measures, if you like, for risk control to help further minimise risks. but. Um, if you look at that, they're not fundamentally dealing with the actual hazards of the machinery. It's still a, they're still about trying to get people to work safely around the machinery while not actually controlling the fundamental hazards. And so that point about making it inherently safer, I think, is a really fundamental one. It's a really difficult thing to do, though, I think, um, in old plants. And I mean, one of the things regulators, and I'm, I'm sure Wes <laughs> experiences too, is that um, in terms of um, you know, older plant, there's always that issue about retrofitting and how, you, how do you make um, old plant um, inherently safe and, and whether retrofitting can actually do that, but yes. Mm. Yeah. Actually, we might come to you, Wes, on that point now. And as a consultant designer uh, for manufacturers, uh, can you tell us please uh, a little about what you do in practice and why safety and design of machinery is really so important in workplaces? Well, yes, I, I think Peter hit the nail on the head that it's basically from start to finish or cradle to grave. Yep. Um, so I assist um, industry with uh, safe design of machinery from inception to disposal effectively. Um, ensuring regula regulatory compliance is one of the most critical steps, but it's understanding that relationship and what is regulatory compliance from a, um, a manufacturer or an employer's point of view. And the interpretation of that differs from each business to the next one, because the legislation really um, gears your um, control and your safe design of machinery to your process and the way that you're using it. Your machinery, the way that you're 
um, applying it, installing it, um, operating it, and so on. So I assist with um, the risk assessment process, and and that's something that we've had a lot of, um, I suppose, trouble with in industry. Um, simplistic risk assessment is 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 commonly done on um, <coughs> not complex plant, but uh, basic plant. But the more complex the uh, the machinery, the more complex the process, uh, the more complex the risk assessment has to be because you have to capture all of these aspects of designing, operating, maintaining, cleaning, disposing, decommissioning, so on. If you don't um, get those um, captured in the risk assessment process, you can't possibly move on to what is the most critical step, which is your risk control design. Um, I spend so much time in the risk control design area because that's where we get the paybacks. If we can put in, and, and one of the things that people um, do in industry is they do the, the process of risk assessment very badly because they don't have the skill sets within their um, reference groups when they're trying to find that information on, on the process out from task and so on and you know disposal maintenance and so on. So they don't have the skill sets in there. Um, people don't have that knowledge to know where to, to go with the process. So they see, as I think Liz mentioned before, a simplistic mechanical hazard and we'll deal with that as a mechanical hazard. But what should the risk control for that be? So they don't have the depth of knowledge to understand and explore the risk assessment process. So in summary, on more complex processes, we don't do that risk assessment process particularly well. So that's where I usually get involved and start getting people thinking about how do we go about this process to get something meaningful out of it. And also you've got to think from the regulatory point of view, can that document stand up in court? Have we done it thoroughly? As I think the first example, um, the, the case of the fatality pulled out, had that document been done, well if it had been done, was it done properly? Did it explore all the, the, the hazards and risks and task related issues? And I'd answer that no at this point because we need to probably inject a little bit of skill there. But then we look at risk control development and risk control development is where I get my job satisfaction because we're talking about trying to change a culture and industry from a, um, a lowest cost solution, um, a simplistic answer to trying to get people to um, almost, we're trying to change their culture, we're trying to twist their minds, but we're trying to aim for also for, for senior executives so that we can make that critical link between good design, better design of, and safe design of machinery and the bottom line of the business. If we can get that relationship right and get those people, appeal to the entrepreneurs in the group, um, twist the minds of the CFOs from a dollar driven um, process to a, a return on investment and demonstrate that then I think that's where we win. But that's, that's the areas or the areas that I work in and, and certainly the most rewarding is the, the risk control design area. Okay. Now, Wes, you mentioned some of the challenges faced by manufacturers and designers in this space and you've had a lot of experience in this. Uh, what are some of the unexpected benefits that you've derived from working directly with these people? Um, the un unexpected benefits, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give a... Um, a case study. Um, I've worked in the timber industry quite a lot. It's a very difficult industry and it has the highest industry levy rates. It has woeful statistics, uh, horrific injuries and it's pretty much on par with the meat industry as well. Now those two industries have done a lot of work in recent times to try and lift their game and I've worked with a, um, a hardwood timber mill um, and they took a different approach and the owner of that business was an entrepreneur or is an entrepreneur and he decided he was going to bring in some CNC controlled equipment from Europe. The trouble is it landed on the deck here and the risk controls weren't with it and what was there wasn't compliant with the Australian standards. So before that process could be put in place and become operational, the systems had to be developed. The good side of that um, is that the solutions that were developed became state of the art. That supplier adopted the risk controls a zoning model, a specific risk control to very difficult problems of uh, um, things like tracking the saws once you've installed the, the massive band saws to break the logs down. Um, that process itself, and I'll, I'll put you in the picture of that, if you're the supervisor you were expected to basically um, adjust this thing manually looking at it and if it went wrong you wore this massive um, band saw if it came off the, uh, the guide wheels. Um, so that was a risk that was totally unacceptable. The solutions to that process of a zoning model which 
meant that no worker was in the same place and time, classic risk management theory, uh, with the hazards, so that you've separated your workers and your hazards, you've controlled it all remotely, no worker handles um, any part of the timber until such time as the process is at zero state, whether control or whole power. Um, and then the um, operation of those controls was done from the control room. So the unexpected benefits in that was also the, the manufacturer adopting those as worldwide standards, OE standards for their equipment, solving the problem of their bandsaw tracking, um, meaning that it was done from the control room after you'd install the bands, not from within the process while it's running. Um, and the cost on return on investment, which really appealed to the owner of the business, was the fact that it cost um, between fifteen and 20000 roughly to put in the, the um, risk controls to track those saws um, and do it safely. The payback on that, when you're considering a, a timber mill of this kind, costs you know, in excess of probably five or $6,000 an hour to run, which is a fairly typical figure. Um, you look at that, we do a, a change every shift at least once, so saving 15 minutes, you can do some simple maths, depending on what shift structure they're running, payback was between four and eight days to put in a process that then became state of the art worldwide. Um, if you think about that, that is a, a, a huge improvement um, and to see the, the rewards from that. But other unexpected benefits of this employer um, running with this in, in an entrepreneurial way and, and basically homing in on that relationship because they could see that it was great for the bottom line of the business, they had significant discounts in their workers' comp insurance. Considering that they were at the worst industry rate, they were, the industry was performing very badly, their performance became so much better than industry that their um, reductions in premiums were in the millions. Okay. So right. they're the unexpected benefits and very rewarding unexpected benefits. Wes, you touched on this in terms of talking about the bottom line. Yes. And, and obviously in terms of incorporating those safety features, it did represent an up, upfront cost. It did. To what extent is cost consideration an issue for manufacturers and designers in implementing those safety principles into their equipment? Um, cost is, is probably the major issue. It's, it's probably uh, my number one enemy in, in the sort of work I do because everything you do is going to cost money. Um, you're dealing with CFOs and CEOs that don't want to spend money. We're trying to create a link between um, better, safer design machinery, better performance in OHS and the bottom line. Concreting that link in and, and getting acceptance of it and getting these guys to free wheel is, is where we need to be because that's the biggest challenge. The finance always gets in the way because we can save money there but they don't look at the holistic picture. They look simply at um, investment, bottom line, cost but they don't look at return on investment. So it's our challenge as professionals to be able to demonstrate that return on investment and do it in a, a pretty much a, I mean, I, I cut my teeth in the automotive industry and we had continuous improvement gurus like Deming. And if you've, in manufacturing, it's lovely because you've got all these process measurables you can draw on. Intelligent use of those measurables, you can demonstrate that what we're doing improves the bottom line. You win the CEOs and the CFOs over, you've got the game there. But it's, that's the biggest challenge of all, is, is the financial and, and getting that um, culture in place. Okay. Well, I might come to you in a moment, Liz, about cost issue as well. But uh, as an extension of that, Wes, can you tell me, how does a manufacturer or designer market their product when, uh, as a consequence of the extra cost, it's going to be uh, at a higher cost than its competitor? Look, um, I think we'd be, be crazy. In, in, in Australia's um, climate at the moment, our industrial climate, we need to market the abilities we have and our, our technology skills are superior and we need to market that. So if we've got um, manufacturers here designing equipment that is state of the art in terms of risk control, that's giving us a, a positive benefit to the bottom line, we need to market that. We need to market it on regulatory compliance because if we're not doing that, I mean, I'm trying to, in, in my client base, it's regulatory compliance is mandatory. We've got to accept that. Yep. We must do it. But I don't want to see very basic compliance. I want to see us going to a level where we select a, um, a compliance at a point where it, it is a positive for the business, not just a have to do um, minimal compliance because the minimal compliance will turn around and ambush you. Yep. So that's, that's probably the, the key message. So it's also return on investment Return as on well. investment yeah. and demonstrating that. You can't just say it's uh, nice to have. 
yep. uh, because you won't get any response from a CFO no. on, on that. Um, you've got to have a, a demonstrated result and you've got to be able to show them the tools that you're using to be able to demonstrate. We need to play on their turf, in other words. We need to play in their language with dollars, numbers and all of that and demonstrate to them that what we're doing can actually demonstrate that result. Um, yep. And that is probably the biggest challenge in doing the sort of work I do. And I think getting it right up front yeah. does actually save money in the long term because the cost of recalls and retrofitting is very expensive. So to, to actually design something well and elegantly at the beginning of the process actually is a win-win situation for everybody. It, it certainly is. And, yeah. and you don't want to be playing catch-ups um, mm. and particularly if, uh, if you've been found uh, um, not compliant with the legislation um, and you're getting uh, any further action as a result of that whether it's uh, simply notices of improvement or whatever, or prohibition, but any subsequent legal action out of that is very costly to a business. And a fatality is a, a major a cost mm -hmm. to a business that can sometimes be terminal. Mm -hmm. And we never want to go there. We don't want to injure people. We don't want to kill them at work. We want to design processes that are, are user friendly and actually work and are productive. Okay, well, Liz, I might just come to you in yes. terms of cost. Has your research found yeah. that cost considerations are an issue? Um, absolutely, cost is, is an issue. And actually, I'm going to um, just deflect this a bit and um, pose a challenge for Peter. <laughs> because <laughs> what the research actually suggests is that one of the biggest issues is companies like those that WES deals with feeling, OK, we're dealing with safety, but that company over there that's doing the same sort of stuff, they're not dealing with safety. The regulator doesn't seem to be inspecting and enforcing with them. So we've got this unlevel playing field. And actually, there's some really rather sad examples of companies that had put themselves out to do safe design, had come up with some great safe design solutions and then found that they couldn't compete with other companies that were still producing the same type of machinery but without the safety features that were effectively adding to the cost of it. So all of this for me raises the issue of how do we get a more consistent and I think networked approach to inspection, invol uh, inspection and enforcement which would mean that as a regulator you're doing it strategically through supply chains and markets. So you're not just focusing on particular companies one at a time, maybe when something terrible goes wrong because there's a fatality at mm. the sort of company that Wes is dealing with. But let's take another example, food processing machinery, let's say. If we could have um, strategies which are dealing with those that design, manufacture, supply, import, key customers as the end users of, of the system who are all being interacted with as part of regulatory strategies, mm -hmm. then you get that impetus through supply chains and markets to help reinforce the importance of safe design, perhaps reinforce key messages about what the design solutions are that you're looking for. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you've got a level playing field where people don't feel that they're going to be missing out because they are trying to deal with safety. Excellent. Now, I think that that uh, has uh, obviously um, provided some fertile information for people who might have questions. So I might at this point in time uh, see if there are any online questions that we have and also invite members of the audience to think about questions as well. We do have a question from Cathy online and the question is, there is some discussion about the need for designers to take a holistic approach when designing machinery. What does this mean and how can designers do this? Wes, I think this is one for you in terms of your experience working directly with manufacturers and designers. How do they take a holistic approach? Well, the holistic approach is that you're not just looking at operating the plant because most people think that, okay, it's, it's while we're normally running um, the process or the machinery or whatever it is that there's a problem and they look at that isolated area in their risk assessments. They don't look at maintaining. They don't look at cleaning. They don't look at decommissioning or commissioning. They don't look at installation. So holistically we mean we need to look at the whole picture of owning and operating that piece of machinery or process or whatever it is. Uh, and I think um, that's, that's basically what it's about. So it's broadening your vision, um, taking the tunnel vision off and looking at your risk assessment processes and being far more thorough and laterally thinking a little bit along the lines of that. Thank you. Peter, I might just come to you on that and you touched on it earlier. Um, does the, the, the law establish a framework for a holistic approach? 
Well, it does. It, it certainly covers all of those things that Wes was talking about, and it really does ensure that people need to, the designers do need to factor in every aspect of the, um, the life cycle of the, um, the item of plant, and that's mm -hmm. quite critical in terms of, of how they do that. So, no, it is, it's a really important element of, um, of design safety and ensuring that we, we, we actually do that. Okay. Uh, Liz, from your research, are we achieving that yet, that holistic approach? Um, I would say not. I think actually to the extent that designers and manufacturers are addressing issues for those who install, maintain, clean, repair and so on, it tends to be a bit incidental to what they're doing for the sort of everyday operation. So if you've got good measures for the operation um, user of the machinery, maybe they're going to flow on to other people as well, but maybe not because you've got different things going on when you're maintaining and so on. Um, and I think one of, the, uh, one of the big issues really is for designers and manufacturers to, in a sense, get their hands dirty in terms of really understanding or understanding the real nature of work. Um, and certainly that involves consultation with workers, but it's even a step more than that because it can be quite hard to get people to actually have input as workers um, into um, discussions about safety, especially at the design stage, which raises the, I guess, the issue of, well, how do you do that effectively? And certainly those who, who do um, get to a better understanding, I guess, of what really goes on in work are those that are trial with prototypes or models, if it's not the sort of machinery that you can actually have the whole thing there for people to trial, people using models, simulations and all sorts of things to try and um, get workers with that sort of experience to tap into their experience and, and uh, raise the genuine safety issues that need to be addressed. Thank you. I think there's a, also a role there with regulators in bringing the parties together. I think where we've had our best successes has been where we've been able to get the designers, the manufacturers and the end users, whichever part of the life cycle together, to really understand what are the issues and what need to be addressed. And I think there is an important role for regulators to help build those networks and, and build those conversations because often where we see the problems, it's where there isn't necessarily the needs of the end user yep. has been really addressed in the design process. Mm. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Cathy, for that question. We have another online question. So we'll go to that now, and this is from Terry. Terry asks, uh, how do you address the competing objectives of aesthetics, practicability, cost and functionality during the manufacturing stage? So in other words, we've got these competing issues, making the machine look good, the aesthetics of the machine, the practicability, cost and functionality, and balancing all of those up. Uh, and in certain instances, it may be that the uh, manufacturer decides that functionality overrides some of the others. Wes, you have any experience with that? Any views about that? It's a pet topic of mine. Excellent. <laughs> um, the, the problem we have is that, um, that uh, uh, if we can put the question up again just so I can get the, uh, the, the whole context of it, but we need to look at all of those aspects and I've basically got a, a copyrighted expression that when we're looking for risk control for processes and that, we're looking not just for an answer that excels in one area. Like we, we want to keep the uh, finance people happy and they want to see the processes productive. Well that's great, but at what cost? Because they're not looking at real cost, they're, they may be looking at just getting parts or getting things out of the end of the process. We've got to look at all aspects of that process and get a best possible compromise risk control solution for that item of machinery. And by compromise, I mean we've, our risk assessment is going to throw up all the different variables that make that process tick. We don't want to excel in some and fall down miserably in the plant safety or the, the risk control area. So we need to get that right. We need to get the user-friendly part right, the, the ergonomics, the human factor side of it, the psychology of the relationship with the, the process, uh, all of that right, and we want to get that answer that's going to work. So I think that's the, the key to it, is, is the best possible compromise risk control. Excellent. Thank, thanks very much, Wes. And thanks, Terry, for that question. It covers all aspects of uh, safety and design. We have another question online, and uh, this question is from Kenneth. And the question is, can the panellists talk about some real-life examples of great machinery design, and uh, what does well-designed machinery look like? Um, 
Lisa, I might uh, just come to you on that. You've done a fair okay. bit of research here, and in terms of, uh, from your research, have you seen some great machinery designs? For me, the, for me, the best examples are those ones that come out of an understanding of what the real nature of work is like. And one that comes to mind is uh, an example of, um, it's, it's actually, um, well, a hand-operated but reasonably large device that's used for um, finishing surfaces. And the people who uh, developed that actually came out of an industry where they used that kind of machinery. And it's interesting, I think, how often those sorts of solutions actually come out of people with that real first-hand experience. Um, and the reason that it was good was that they understood exactly what it was like to be dealing with um, dusts which might be coming from all sorts of um, synthetic as well as timber materials. Um, they knew what it was like to be uh, straining with um, an item of machinery in terms of the, the physical strain and the potential for overuse. Um, and so basically came up with an, a design which was a device that was easy to manoeuvre and uh, really effectively um, controlled the dust issues in terms of dust extraction. So, And there were some other things, but I guess the point there is really when you understand the real issues for people using it, um, it means so much more when you're coming up with the solutions. Okay, and where's you mentioned the, the timber industry? The, the example, yes, the example I was giving earlier is uh, an example of intelligent design. Um, very good design in the sense that Okay, if, if anyone's ever been into a timber mill, a traditional mill, you're hand feeding timber into machines. And it's, things can go horribly wrong and uh, people end up being severely uh, injured as a result. This process, by separating the hazards from the workers, um, creates a, an environment that is very difficult to get injured. If the hazards are in there and you're out here, and if you want to go in there, then the hazards are no longer there because you've placed that zone in a controlled state or a whole power state if you're doing major maintenance work. So that sort of design is very good, but not only that, your interfaces with the process and the user friendliness of those, um, because if you've done your homework with your, your risk assessment with your, your user groups um, and you've got that interaction and, and got the dynamics going in that group, um, you've developed an interface that's very friendly to them and performs well, it doesn't frustrate them it doesn't drive them nuts because it breaks down every five minutes and you've got to fix it. Um, they're the sorts of issues that you need to home in on. So a good design process will tick all the boxes as best as possible across the, the line. And that's what great design is about, is getting something that works in all of those areas. That yep. Your people can take ownership because they've had the, uh, the involvement in the development of the process. And it's quite amazing how that, that relationship snowballs once you've got those people accepting that they were part of the design of the, the process that actually works, whereas it hasn't before. Um, the, the sort of dynamics of that, getting that moving and getting that ownership is just, the, the, the power that's that in that relationship is amazing. Thank you, Liz. Um, um, Peter, I was just about to ask the regulator, any yeah. views there about real life machines yeah, well, that work? Yeah, just picking up on Liz's point, I mean, I really like the idea of design thinking and I mean, architects do it all the time. They prototype, they design, they, they yeah. do drawings for their clients and work through and eventually prototype into something that works. Um, our best examples, I think, are where we have worked with industry and worked with users and um, there are a good couple of examples in our safe design program where we've, um, you know, whether it's been grain augers or fence post drivers or wood chippers, where we've sat down with the industry and tried to work through what, what wasn't working and what needed to be working and that was an iterative process of working out some different trial and error about what would work better and more effectively in terms of that. So I think we can learn a lot from the architecture profession in terms of how they um, use that process of, um, of um, prototyping mm. and, um, mm. and continuous learning okay. and, and working with clients to actually understand their needs and, and what you want to get out of the process. Okay. Um, a theme of engagement I'm reading from this process mm -hmm. as well, which is important. I might now just ask uh, our audience here if there, there are any questions you have of panel members. Yes? Um, yes, my question is, does anyone have any comments on um, approaches for working through situations where there's really conflicting views about what constitutes safety in design? Because um, I'm thinking of an example, for example, in quad bikes, it's been quite an issue of what is safe design of quad bikes. 
Okay, I, I might uh, actually invite uh, Peter to respond to this mm. and perhaps Liz from you as well, from your experience. So Peter, yeah. and th the example of quad bikes has mm. been mentioned and uh, views about what actually constitutes safety in design. Yeah, I think that's a great, um, a great question because it's a really live issue in terms of quad bikes. And um, for us, I guess it is about getting down to, um, again, getting all of the parties together to try and work out a solution on, on what the issues are. So for quad bikes, certainly, um, you know, part of the approach we've taken is to commission research, so really have an evidence-based approach um, to try and really resolve some of the design issues and some of the concerns that we know users have in terms of quad bikes and then working with the industry to, um, to try and change perceptions and understanding, I guess, of, of what those issues are. So for us, it's been, um, again, a bit of an iterative process of working through, um, you know, focusing on um, things going through from PPE right through to actually um, better stability of the quad bikes, um, better design, um, and really pushing, trying to push the suppliers up the, uh, basically up the hierarchy of hazard controls to try and get them to think about, well, it's not just about training, it's not just about um, helmets, it's not about how people use the um, equipment. You really need to design in elements that are going to make the, the equipment more, more stable uh, and more safe to use. So we've certainly been uh, using that as an approach and I think there's some really good learnings from that. I mean one of the things we've been pushing for I guess is uh, the idea of having some consumer safety, better consumer safety information about the, the stability of different types of quad bikes so people have more choice about the, um, uh, about the safer options in terms of those or actually using other side-by-side -side equipment. So what else is, is safer to use in terms of those? So um, there's a whole range of things that we're doing at the moment to, to look at that. But it, it is a really good question because um, quad bikes is a really complex issue because it's not just a workplace issue, it's also a recreational issue. Um, it's used in lots of other aspects. So um, it's hard, it, it, it shows the complexity, I think, in plant. Plant often covers not just workplaces, it covers across many other boundaries. So um, as a regulator, it's a very complex space to navigate sometimes. Mm. And it's, uh, Liz, does that resonate with you in terms um, of your research? Uh, yes, it does. And actually, I was going to just say that I think you could sort of answer this question in two contexts, in a way. One's this sort of wider regulatory context where it's been really important with the particular example that you've raised of, of the um, uh, quad bikes for that to be underpinned by some really sound research as to what the, what the technical issues are in terms of stability and all, all of those sorts of factors, which then I think puts the regulator and others in a better position to actually advocate for what is safer design. Um, and there are some other good examples of that being done by regulators in the past. Um, in Victoria, there was some really good research that was done around forklifts because everybody presumed, presumed as with quad bikes, um, that the issues were all about the operators hooning around and not you know, operating these things safely. Um, and it actually turned out that there were real serious issues that related to forklifts not actually having the braking capacity for the usual speeds that they were driven at, um, all sorts of issues around s stability and tendency to tip over and things like that. So in that case, there was a, a role there with the regulator being able to um, define some design solutions and advocate um, for those solutions to be put in place. But the other context I wanted to just raise, because I guess these um, the differences of opinion about what's safe, they come about for individual companies as well um, in the context of you know one-off particular designs and uh, uh, the research that I've done certainly suggests that those issues are better resolved when you involve teams of people basically in that process of recognising and uh, recognising hazards and deciding what you're going to do about them. So bringing people from different perspectives again but in, in the workplace context um, similar to what you're trying to do I guess in a regulatory context as well. Yes, thanks Liz. Uh, any further questions from the audience? There's a question here. Thanks. Thanks, you've talked about this a bit already, but um, with cost, but um, does regulation tend to drive safe work design or is safe work design a commercial imperative, particularly for the designer's reputation? Thank you for that question. I think that any of the panel members could probably have a view on this. So mm. does regulation drive safe design or is safe design a commercial issue? Um, I think 
I yeah. think just yeah. relying on legislation isn't enough. I mean, I think what designers need to do is really be focusing on harm prevention because we know you can comply with standards but still have um, you know, un, you know, unsafe safety issues in terms of the, um, the plant that you're producing. So for us, it's um, so and certainly I know as regulators, we can check that people are complying with the standards, but often um, there are other issues that need to be addressed in, in terms of ensuring harm prevention. So I would always be advocating for, um, for duty holders to be looking at the harm prevention, what's going to cause harm, what am I doing about that and how am I controlling it? and not thinking so much about, well, is this, have I ticked all the boxes in terms of the statutory obligations? Because that doesn't necessarily lead to, to safe design ultimately. So, so for me, it's really about an emphasis on the harm prevention. Okay, where's your experience? Um, the regulatory framework sets basically the, the, the standard or the, the basic minimum um, compliance level, but it's up to the, the person who uh, is the duty holder to actually explore that and work out where their solution to the problem sits. That's probably the bit we don't do well, as I touched on before. But it certainly is a, a commercial imperative because if we're going to do it properly, we've got to sell the benefits of doing it properly back again. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, it is absolutely critical that we get that relationship in there yeah. because we're going to get it right if we can prove that it works. Okay. Liz, does your research show that um, uh, the, the, the regulatory requirements uh, prevail or uh, do the commercial instincts drive the manufacturer? Um, I think the research suggests that the commercial instincts are drivers, but regulation, and I use that in the sense of both the law and the inspection and enforcement, is part of the mix in terms of uh, factors that motivate organisations to address health and safety issues. I'm inclined to say that regulation in that sense is, uh, yes, it's a driver, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't give people all that they're looking for in terms of uh, capacity, so understanding what it is that they actually need to do. And that's where uh, other aspects of the wider regulatory influences come into play. And in particular, um, things like the technical standards for the safety of machinery, which are not formally legal standards. They're certainly referenced in codes of practice, um, but they have a momentum in a way that, for example, Health and Safety Act regulations type of thing don't. So the technical standards are, are an important part of that momentum for uh, driving health and safety improvements. Thank you. One yeah. of the things yeah. I liked mm. about your research, um, Liz, was um, that idea that um, community of practice is almost as important as the regulation and if you can connect people and um, yeah. they learn from each other and it's really, I think, an important role for us all to be facilitating that and ensuring that happens. The networking side yeah. of that. So really communication critical. is becoming yes. a powerful instrument yeah. Yeah. in yeah. this space. Yes. Yeah. Okay, now I have one more uh, question online and I'd like to take that question now. This is from Leo. Um, Leo runs a small business. Uh, how can he get help to ensure that uh, the machinery he puts into the workplace is safe? Uh, now this is the most relevant question because we've been talking about the information and communication process. Here we have a small business person. He wants to make sure that what he puts into the workplace is safe. How does he, uh, how does he go about making sure that that's the case? Please. If, if I can address that, look, I mean, it's the duty on any uh, um, small business operator, any employer, that they need to get appropriate expertise to assist them with what they're doing. Um, this is not a commercial plug, but um, certainly they need to seek technical advice to be able to assist them to make sure that they've got the machinery in their workplace safe. And, and that's where the, the duty is. So it's, it's really their responsibility to engage someone or talk to the regulator who can quite often provide advice and assistance or guidance in those directions, certainly bring them up to speed with what their responsibilities are. Um, and that's a sort of a great starting point for them probably, but bringing in that, that uh, resource is, is probably the most important thing to that business. So Peter, contacting the regulator will assist in mm. providing information about what the legal requirements are? That, that's absolutely right. And I mean, I, we have great sympathy for small business operators and how they access that information. I mean, we're actually operating in a global economy and uh, people are often buying things from overseas, buying them um, you know, from trade shows and all sorts of things. 
um, you know, internationally and uh, often standards which um, are, are, are told to be, uh, you know, are said to be equivalent are not always equivalent. So there certainly is worth checking if people are buying major purchases, certainly checking out with the regulator and um, we're certainly willing to help. We do see people get into to trouble where they think they done the right thing and bought something, but it may not be compliant with um, with um, Australian standards or Australian requirements. Okay. So it's really important, I think, to do the homework, yes. Thank yeah. you. Uh, just on that point, I'd like to ask, um, uh, is the legal framework adequate for dealing with safe design and machinery? Mm. Look, I think the legislative framework we've got is the, the best you can have in terms of, um, of addressing it. We've got very much a... Um, uh, um, a, a a prevention approach to the um, our legislation. So, I mean, it really is um, performance based. It's really designed about trying to get the right outcomes. Um, so you can't be too prescriptive because we know that, um, you know, internationally things, that social environments change and technologies change and you can't anticipate every change in terms of plants. So the framework we've got is, um, is good. Um, I think it is effective in terms of, um, of having the right controls, but it's more about um, really about making sure people are aware of those controls and I think as Liz was talking before people don't necessarily um, always um, you know refer to the legislation so it's raising awareness not so much about legislation but about what's important in terms of what people need to do to design safely. Okay. So, yep. yeah. Liz in the context of what Peter's just told us about the legislation and the legal framework uh, what do you think needs to be done now to improve the outcomes in the safe design of machinery? Um, look the from the research that I've done, people who design and manufacture machinery have a strong preference for, I guess, what I'd call hands-on learning in the sense of um, uh, getting practical opportunities to actually find out um, how to actually do safety in a sense. So, you know, you can provide information in a written form about safety, but actually what people are looking for is how do you do it in practice. Um, and that leads me to think that there would be great value in, I think, regulators banding together with um, educational um, education providers, professional industry associations, and looking at um, providing programs which can uh, are structured around those practical opportunities. So what does it actually mean in practice to be recognising hazards? How do you go about doing that? What are the practical ways for actually making sound decisions about how you control risks? How do you do your testing and examination of machinery that you're expected to do? Um, how do you effectively involve workers? So these are all very practical, hands-on type things. Um, and uh, I think there'd be great value in looking at how we can provide uh, programs that help build capacity and build those sorts of knowledge and skills. Okay, thank you Liz. I'd like to now again ask uh, our audience here if there are any further questions that you might have. No? Yes, one question here. <coughs> how important is it to know who you're designing for? Um, know their shape, their size, given a lot of machinery is about people having to control difficult and complex environments. How do we know that we're designing for Australians? Okay, well, as I might refer this one to you. And this is a question about how do you cater for all of those hazards, and that includes the hazards of catering for differences in individuals. Okay, I'll put my ergonomist's hat on for that one. Um, we need to, when we're designing um, mm -hmm interfaces for people, we need to design those interfaces for the people, it, which means we need to take into consideration um, the variation in stature, um, physical size, etc. in our, our workforce. Um, unfortunately in Australia our, our databases are um, not where they probably should be, but there's a major project uh, uh, within the Human Factor Society to work on getting us a, a database um, of the Australian population. But an ergonomist knows how to interpret the databases that are available and there's various software packages that are available that assist you in designing for people. But it is, an, it is critical that we design um, interfaces for, for the, the range of user groups. And I'll give you an example from a, a shift manufacturing um, organisation and um, they were operating assembly machines um, and on the day shift the guy that operated it was about six foot four and on the night shift 
the lady that operated it was about four foot two. And she's basically working up here and he's working down there. So there was a total mismatch in the design of those workstations. So if you appreciate that both of them were within, were within um, perhaps 95% of our, our expected user population, if we know those limits, we know where the boundaries are, we can design to cater for that and we can put in appropriate risk controls like adjustable floors, uh, adjustable processes to be able to get those interfaces to the correct height and get those working relationships because it, it's a three-dimensional model. It may not be just height, it may be reach, it, it can be any way that we relate with, uh, with people. Um, vision, if we're talking control room environments and that sort of stuff, you've got to design for focal lengths um, and for information and interpretation of that information. So a professional ergonomist is, is someone that can assist you in that area uh, in terms of getting that information and making that uh, relationship work for you. Thank you, Tom. Any further questions? No, no further questions. We start to um, come to the conclusion of the discussion. And, and for that, I'd actually like to uh, refer to the panelists about a particular takeaway message. So in other words, we're dealing with a very key issue with respect to safety and design, design of machinery. And uh, I'd like to ask each of the panel me members what their takeaway message is for you. When you go away from here and think about safety and design, what is it you should be thinking about? So Peter, from a regulator's perspective, what's, what's a key takeaway message with respect to safety and design? Yeah, well for me it's a, it is about that thinking early and really trying to anticipate all of the types of hazards that will arise throughout the life cycle of the product. So really making sure at the front end that we get that right so people, the users at the, 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 the back end are not being injured in the process. Okay, and Liz? Um, I think for me it's, it is that fundamental message about we're trying to make machinery inherently safer and at the end of the, the, the day we'll only achieve that when we do recognise the full range of, of ways in which the machinery could be hazardous um, and take steps to address those, that range of hazards. And Wes? Um, look, my takeaway message would be that injury and illness from work is unacceptable. And we need to target the decision makers. We need to convert their thinking. And we need to achieve a, a culture of not having to do it, but a culture of wanting to do it right. And that's, I think, the fundamental message I'd like to put through. Cheers, thank you. And clearly, safety and design is a fundamental issue. It is embedded within the Australian Work Health and Safety Strategy. It's an identified action area. and. Um, what I would like to think is that today we've had a vital discussion on some of the issues of concern with regards to safety and design, but more importantly on how we achieve positive outcomes that are going to drive safety for people operating machinery and equipment. And, uh, and we've got key messages here, and I think if I could sum it up in terms of saying that some of those key messages relate to communication, information and engagement. And what we need to do is to work actively with one another as regulators, as researchers and as practitioners within this space to ensure that we look at the front end process to ensure that the hazards are eliminated or minimised at the design st stage. That's what this is all about, that's what this discussion has been about uh, and I'd like you to put your hands together and thank our panel members, Peter, Liz, Wes. <laughs> <laughs>